Hello, and thank you for joining us here at Christians United for Israel. I'm Sandra Hagee Parker, the chairwoman of the Christians United for Israel Action Fund, and we are so happy to have Attorney General Miares joining us from Virginia today. Attorney General, welcome. Honored to be with you. Thank you so much. Let's get right to it. Attorney General, your office is leading from the front in the United States in terms of combating anti-Semitism in your state and on your campuses. You know more than better than anybody else that there has been over 200% increase in anti-Semitic incidents in your state alone. Your office has been an office of action. It is not just words. And at KUFI, that is something that we appreciate. We say love is not what you say. We say love is what you do. Talk to us a little bit about the tools that your office is using as the attorney general of your commonwealth to get in front of this scourge, especially on our campuses. Well, no, I, I, I appreciate your kind words, but that is a great charge that's put in our office. We like to say in the attorney general's office, we view ourselves as the people's protector. And that obviously includes our, our Jewish citizens that right now are, are looking over their shoulder in fear. And uh, I've often said anti-Semitism is the world's oldest form of bigotry. Uh, it's like this hideous virus that comes out at different times throughout human history. And we're seeing it in all of its ugly forms now on our college campuses and, and folks marching in the streets. And it's it's really unfortunate. So we I have a great partner with um, a Governor Glenn Youngkin, and uh, we've had it. He had an anti-Semitism uh, commission. We actually put together an anti-Semitism anti-Semitism task force in the office of the attorney general, the first in its country to tackle this because we wanted to be, get everybody at the table, both law enforcement those that have a specific background on this and individuals in our office to fight the scourge. Because right now we've seen this explosion of hate and anger really since October 7th. It was always there. It was boiling up. But I almost feel like October 7th took the lid off this 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 virulent strain of anti-Semitism that's rearing its head everywhere. And I think it's really incumbent upon Everybody, what, whatever your position of leadership, whether you're in government or even out of government, but the one thing I don't think is acceptable is to be silent. Mm. I really appreciate our partners at KUFI that are not silent. You all have been fantastic advocates as well, uh, advocating for defending our Jewish brothers and sisters during this really difficult time we see in our country. Thank you. Thank you for that. And we feel the same. Um, you know that we've been fighting for adoption of the IRA definition of anti-Semitism since 2016 at the federal level um, and have been working since that time to get it adopted across the nation. We know that Virginia also recognized the IRA definition as well in its state after the federal government failed to adopt it. Um, how crucial of a tool do you think that the IRA definition is as attorney general and just the broader policy arena in terms of helping people rightly identify anti-Semitism? Well, I think it's a critical uh, step and a critical tool for both law enforcement and elected officials like myself. Uh, by adopting the IRA definition, it is a great guidepost for us, particularly when we're talking to our college administrators. Uh, because what we're seeing is we're seeing a lot of actions, a lot of slogans, even things that are said being said uh, on college campuses within classrooms that are obviously anti-Semitic. And it creates that great framework for us when we communicate with with those in government. Of uh, Now, this is that ugly uh, face of anti-Semitism that is now rearing its head. So I think other states should. I'm very proud of Governor Youngkin. That was something that came out both from um, his commission and our task force we have in the AG's office. Uh, we worked hard with the General Assembly, openly supporting that measure. We're really grateful it got signed the law by Governor Youngkin. I'm going to take this time, since I have an attorney general with us, I'm just a lowly lawyer. I am not the people's protector. But one of the main oppositions that we hear to IRA is that, quote, it's an impediment to free speech. And can you clarify for our viewers, for our members, even members of the opposition that may be watching, IRA is a definition that applies to help you determine whether an underlying action is motivated right. by anti-Semitism. 
Can you just kind of clarify that point? Because I think so many times the opposition wants to wrap themselves in the American flag more often than not the First Amendment and use it as a shield so that they can use their sword to inflict harm. And IRA has nothing to do with controlling speech. So could you unpack that a little bit more as an attorney general for people that might be confused on that point? Well, listen, the First Amendment in our country is broad. It protects speech. It protects speech we disagree with. It protects speech that maybe we vehemently find offensive. And that's and I think that's important. And, then, <clears throat> and so I'm a huge advocate of, of the First Amendment. It's obviously one of the most important protections that we have. But you're exactly what what Ira simply de- de- uh, shows is when you're acting in an anti-Semitic way. I'll give you an example. We had a situation on a college campus in Virginia of a professor in class saying, well, Hitler wasn't really anti-Semitic. He just wanted better. He wanted to better the lives of the German people. Right. And so obviously, uh, you know, people may have a First Amendment right to say certain things. But on the flip side, part of your job as a college administrator is to recognize when somebody brings a complaint saying, well, this is pretty blatantly anti-Semitic to be able to have that standard written in the code. And so that's where that could be incredibly, uh, incredibly beneficial. Uh, People have a right to say things, obviously, but this is where it's very beneficial in an employer employee relationship of what is and can't be defined as anti-Semitism. So um, it is a it is a critical tool, but your First Amendment rights are very broad. That's a very well-known Supreme Court case that said that um, in Ohio, they allowed a street permit, a, a parade permit to be issued uh, for the for the Klan. Obviously, I think we all vehemently hate, despise the Ku Klux Klan. They're an evil organization. But the question was, do they have a First Amendment right to say things, even things that we vehemently disagreed with? And the Supreme Court ruled, obviously, they do. And so nobody's going to be taking away your First Amendment rights. It's just an important tool in the toolkit for for those in elective office and those that are operating, in some cases, public schools or public universities. Thank you so much. Um, One of the things that other states are looking into, uh, my state in particular, I'm the vice chair of the Texas Holocaust, Genocide, Anti-Semitism Advisory Commission, quite the mouthful, uh, is how we can better utilize codes of conduct on our school campuses and on our college campuses within the state in order to help enact reform. And I know that you have dealt with this in Virginia, more specifically with colleges and universities. But what have you done in your state to try and touch the students and the faculty at the K through 12 level on this issue? These kids don't just show up in college and learn this type of hatred. So so what have you done to kind of uh, get in front of that? Well, I mean, listen, we've helped guide our universities on their student code of conduct. Uh, what's what's acceptable? Having a label playing field for everyone On K through 12, we're very proud of the work we've done with something called Virginia Rules, uh, which is a a program that we have offered to the attorney general's office as a curriculum given to our 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 public school systems, because we do think that one of the core functions of our public education system is producing good citizens and uh, producing those that are able to engage in debate. Not do so in a way where they're attacking or in some case when you have right now entire generation of young people, one of most of which don't even know, a large percentage don't even know the Holocaust happened. Mm. I'm a big believer and I tell my staff all the time, 90% of life's problems can be traced to either poor or miscommunication. Mm. And the best way to fight bad information is with good information. So we want to get that good information and make sure as part of our Virginia rules curriculum that we're talking about anti-Semitism, because you're right, a lot of these students show up on campus and they're really ignorant. They mm. don't know both the history of the Jewish people, the history of Israel, uh, the fact that this is a nation that's been invaded and attacked multiple times throughout their history, the fact that they were created by a United Nations mandate, yeah. um, and that it's really uh, that that Israel now is in many ways the only functioning democracy in the whole Middle East where people have freedom of speech, freedom of worship, uh, things of that nature, the ability to, to vote and pick their own leaders. There's so much that does it that, that so many young people don't know any of that. So we just think with Virginia rules, it's been important to be part of that, to make sure that our young people in in Virginia in particular are properly educated. Amazing. And we love how you're taking that holistic approach. It's not one size fits all. You're not going to be able to hit an easy button and fix the problem. You're really attacking this holistically. Um, Let's talk Israel. 
we know that you went twice last year. You might be mm. one of the few people that went before 10-7 and then again after 10-7. And you've talked a little bit about how you went to two yeah. different countries. Would you just <clears throat> unpack that for us and your personal takeaways from that experience? Well, it was incredibly transformative. I went in, in the spring of 2023 last year and I, I led a delegation of attorney general from around the country, bipartisan, uh, because Israel can never be a, a partisan issue, in my opinion. And right. we we actually first flew into Poland, went to Krakow mm -hmm. and, and uh, went to Auschwitz. And I thought it was important for the AGs to see kind of the worst of humanity by seeing the, the death camps and seeing Auschwitz incredibly moving. And then we flew from uh, Krakow and Poland after we visited Auschwitz to Israel. And I and I told my colleagues, we went, we saw the worst of humanity by seeing the, the death camps to seeing now the only really thriving, functioning democracy in the Middle East. Israel is one of the best of humanity. And it was it was a fantastic visit. I had a chance to visit some of the holy sites that are important to my faith as a believer, um, as a Christian. And it was an incredible experience and know every AG on the trip was impacted. Uh, but then I got invited back in November, uh, uh, about a month after the attack, um, along with the Attorney General of Argentina, the Chief Counterterrorism Prosecutor in, in France and their colleague in both Germany and Austria. Because one thing I've pointed out is, is that the October 7th wasn't just an attack on Israel, right. it was an attack on Western democracy. Mm -hmm. It was the worst terrorist attack uh, on America since 9-11. Yeah. And uh, we we actually had an, a dual citizen that had spent a good portion of her life in, in Virginia that was uh, kidnapped and tragically now has had his life murdered by Hamas. And so we went there and I will tell you, it was it was like visiting two different countries. Anybody who's visited Israel will tell you, will tell you Ben Gurion International Airport, one of the busiest airports on the planet. And we landed, the only plane we could get on was El Air, was the only one flying in. And we flew into a, a ghost town, oh. other than the images of the kidnapped victims. Uh, that's what we saw. And I will tell you, what was so impactful was they they put us in a secure room. They showed us the video of the, the video footage collected from the GoPro cameras and the security mm -hmm. footage. And, you know, Hitler tried to hide what he did. Yeah. Uh, Hamas was a celebration of death. It was unlike anything I have ever seen or witnessed in my life and um you know when i was a young prosecutor there was there was some pretty bad stuff that came across my desk i've never seen anything and i will tell you what was the most impactful for me was the next day we went down to barry which is on the border with gaza and maybe it's because i have three daughters this impacted me in particular but i i walked into a little girl's room mm. and her dolls were still on the floor and she was probably just seven or eight she'd overturned her bed clearly to try to hide from these hamas killers and in the corner uh, where they presumably executed her was still bullet holes and blood mm -hmm. and you could still smell the death i mean it was it was a horrific experience what we saw and then for me to be standing in that little girl's room that had been murdered and 24 hours later to be at jfk waiting for my connecting flight back to virginia and i look up at a screen and i see college students waving hamas flags and shouting hamas slogans i just thought well, when we need more moral clarity, we have moral confusion on our campuses. And it really redoubled my efforts and my commitment to try to push back on the scourge of what's happening right now. That leads us into my next question. Um, there's been a lot of talk in the news about foreign influence on American college campuses, both in terms of the billions of dollars that they're pouring into individual departments and their outright funding now of these encampments that have overtaken uh, many campuses in the United States. Uh, what's concerning about the reports is how it doesn't even just cover anti-Semitism. They're not trying to uh, embolden anti-Semites. They're trying to strengthen and recruit for terrorist organizations. So, Without getting into any ongoing cases that I know as attorney general you're a part of, what can you share with us and any other attorneys general about what they can do in their states to stop this influence from bleeding into our universities? 
Well, it is clear. I mean, the federal government has confirmed that they are they know that non, you know, some non-state actors and some state actors, including Iran, are trying to influence what's happening on our college campuses. I could tell you what I saw um, uh, firsthand is we saw in Virginia, for example, uh, there is a level of organization that shows these are not just random college students that are getting together at Virginia Commonwealth University in Richmond. We had an incident where we had the police that wanted to break up protests in a campus that was in clear violation of a variety of different measures and disorderly conduct. And an individual showed up with helmets and goggles, hiding their faces with bullhorns. They were giving instructions to these students of how to try to flank these officers uh, to try to surround them. We had, a, at first, it seemed a disturbing report of a possible chemical attack. There on the officers, we later were able to ascertain they had taken bear spray, taken a water bottle, emptied it half out, put the bear spray in the bottle and used it as almost like a makeshift uh, chemical bomb that they threw at the officers, obviously caused an enormous amount of irritation. That is apparently training that could be done and has been done for some of these agitators. So there's a level of sophistication that we're seeing uh, on our college campuses. And so uh, I have had these conversations with other AGs, other like-minded AGs around the country. They're, they're keeping a very, very close eye on our campuses. But uh, these are not just sprouting out of the ground like weeds. Mm -hmm. Some of these uh, protests are absolutely being helping to be funded by outside groups. And it's part of our job to get, be able to get to the truth of what, what is or isn't happening on our campuses. Moving on, we know that Virginia has been a big supporter of anti-BDS measures, uh, both when you were in the legislature and your governor as well. What do you see as a path forward in ensuring that the anti-BDS movement is held in check, not only through laws, which KUFI is working diligently to finally see one passed at the federal level, now that more than 37 states have done so on their own. What do you see is available to states, even through state entities like your board that you created in terms of making sure that these anti-BDS measures, which are nothing more than economic anti-Semitism, uh, stayed in check? Yeah, well, you're exactly right. And we saw, for example, some of it is just, I, I feel like in my position as a public official to speak out mm -hmm. and need when when UVA passed a student referendum asking UVA to divest itself from uh, any company that does business with Israel or Israeli companies, I sent a very public letter to the board pointing out uh, the IRA definition, for example. That was actually one of the helpful tools I was able to point out that we had passed in Virginia and that uh, obviously the, the founder of the BDS movement openly bragged that part of his goal was the destruction of the state of Israel. Uh, so I think that's that is a critically uh, important aspect. Now, you know, I think a variety of states have had and there's a different ways that you can adopt. But, you know, one of which is just saying, listen, if you want to do business with the state, you want a state contract, you can't be uh, committing in a BDS movement uh, against Israel. You can't be seeking to boycott Israel. So uh, I think a lot of states have adopted that. Um, Virginia, I know that we I helped carry the resolution condemning the BDS movement when I was in the legislature. We'd love to see something codified. If we can get that through, I know the governor, Youngkin, has an interest in that as well. We have to get some of our friends on the other yeah. side of the aisle to agree to bring some of these uh, measures forward. But I know it's something that we are seeing some bipartisan support. And I hope we can get something to the governor's desk uh, early next year. It's so important that it remains a nonpartisan issue. We, of course, at CUFI, are nonpartisan and concerning BDS, we we like to say, if you want to do BDS, that's fine, just not on my time and not on my dime. So <laughs> right. I, I think I think that wraps a bow on it pretty good for for anybody who thinks that to your point, we're trying to say you can't. Uh, you can do it, but we're not going to underwrite it. Um, I want to talk a little bit about your mom. Uh, I think at this point she's famous <laughs> um, because. <laughs> She's part of your origination story. Um, and it's an amazing, it's an amazing story how how she came over from Cuba with nothing. And um, and here she is, the American dream, and, and her son is the attorney general of Virginia. Um, as somebody that grew up in an immigrant's household, fleeing a communist country, and you see now the children and the students in America's college campuses defending 
nations. And I really wish that we were just talking about students, we, even in our own mm. Congress, right? Yeah. Defending nations and actors like Iran, like Hezbollah, like Hamas, China, um, Russia, countries that are the antithesis of what America is and what America stands for. What do you feel personally and how does that impact you as a child of somebody that fled those environments to come to this country to see those seeds of hatred being watered in our country? Well, I mean, I remember as a young child, one of my early memories was my mother walking to our kitchen and asking me to teach her the Pledge of Allegiance. It's amazing. Because uh, she, she had to learn it for her naturalization ceremonies. And you have those memories of things that stick with you that you realize, well, my family is different. And, uh, you know, I tell my daughters all the time that gratitude is the most underrated of human traits. Mm -hmm. And ingratitude is the ugliest, but gratitude is the most underrated. And I was raised to have such gratitude of what this country is. That this country is able to, uh, when my mother fled Cuba, she was able to come to the United States and seek freedom. I can't tell you how important that is, that so many young people don't realize that what we have is special and unique. And so, you know, she, she got on an airplane as a scared, penniless and homeless 19 year old teenager in Havana, Cuba with nothing. Uh, the government had taken everything from her. They had nationalized her house at that point. So she literally, everything was taken from her in the name of, quote, fairness and equity. And uh, she fled in the fall of 1965. And then almost 50 years to the day after she fled in the fall of 2015, she was able to go into a voting booth and get a ballot with my name on it. and was able to vote for me to represent her in the oldest democracy in the Western Hemisphere, the Virginia General Assembly. It is what I call the American miracle. Yeah. It is indeed a miracle to be able for her to see that. And then later, six years after that, to see her son get sworn in as the top law enforcement officer, uh, defend the U.S. and Virginia Constitution, fleeing a country that has no recognition of a bill of rights or individual dignity. What we have is precious and unique. And I tell young people all the time, we think that what we have in this country is normal. Mm -hmm. uh, but freedom of speech, freedom of religion, freedom of association, it's actually really unique and precious. And it needs to be fought, it needs to be preserved. And if you just stop for a minute and think 99% of every human being that has ever lived did not live their life the way we live our life now. Mm -hmm. We could worship God according to the dictates of our conscience. We could speak out against those that are in power and we can cast a ballot for our leaders. We're very rare, we're very unique. Mm -hmm. Let's make sure we preserve and make sure that's precious. That's another reason why I've always been a passionate defender of Israel, that in that sea of despotism in the Middle East, they recognize the rights of, of freedom of worship, including those that aren't that are Christians. Yeah. Um, they, they have a, a roughly 20 percent of their Knesset are actually Muslim uh, Israeli citizens that are members of the Knesset. And so they have a very pluralistic vibrant democracy with a lot of different voices in it. Um, and I think it's critically important that we recognize who they are and also stand with them. Um, stand, standing with Israel, I think, is, is important. Anti-Semitism, and I'll end with this, anti-Semitism has been said to be a sign of a sickness in society mm. or an institution. And so when you see anti-Semitism just, in some cases, take over some of our colleges, particularly in the Northeast, it's actually a sign that that is, a, that is an institution that's dealing with a real problem, a virus, and that evil virus is anti-Semitism. And I remind people, Germany was one of those highly educated societies prior to the Holocaust, Pro probably had more opera houses than any other place in Europe. And, and German philosophers were the, considered the best philosophers right, uh, in Europe, but they went down this incredibly dark path. And so it's important for us, all of us to be vigilant particularly during this time period. And I really, again, appreciate my partners at KUFA to do so much to raise this issue and make sure this is relevant, that, that we can't sit on the sidelines and be silent. And I think that's my important message for everyone. Thank you so much, Attorney General Morales, for joining us. Thank you for leading from the front on this issue. God bless you and the work that you're doing in Virginia for Israel and the Jewish people. Thank you. God bless you. Bye.